Why do you use blue? Why do I use blue? Because some words suggest a great deal just by themselves. While blue is a color, it's also um, attributed to a state of mind called the blues, a kind of melancholy, because we're called the blue planet, um, seen from space, the oceans of Earth are blue, because blue is a, a quality um, that's water, one of the elemental qualities, and it's also a kind of music. And so without ever evoking um, manic depressive disorder or depression or melancholy or sorrow or mourning or sadness, blue contains that within it. It is a fluid color. It is very easy to manipulate blue with other sounds and other words. It's a very amenable and friendly color. It's uh, something that a writer would want to be involved with. Um, yes, I did use blue in, de in the story Desert Blues. Almost all those stories in Squandering the Blue, um, where blue is used as a concept. It's the blue of the Mekong Delta in Tall Tales from the Mekong Delta. That blue is also the blue of radium, it is the blue of narcotics, it's the blue of the China Sea, it's the blue of Frida Kahlo's morphine, and the blue in her paintings. Um, all colors are subject to whatever authority the writer brings to them, and that was my blue, my official blue period, and all the short stories in Squandering the Blue are built around the color blue, and I thought that it could serve as a further architectural structural device in the building of the stories, so that they would have an internal consistency by the constant brushwork of the blue so that they would be not just a random assortment of short stories, but when glued into a certain blue perspective, they would have a, a sum greater than the parts, and that's what you need for a book of short stories. Together they must produce, like, have a critical mass, and then produce an atomic reaction. That's when you have a successful collection of short stories. Can you talk about the paint strip exercise where you get the paint strips from the hardware store? Yes, the paint strip exercise. Uh, I would go and get paint strips from all the stores have them and you can go and get them. And for every blue and green and red they have hundreds of varieties, all with fabulous names. And Donald Raleigh came into workshop one time with a fabulous poem, and we asked him where he got it, and he said he got it out of um, actually procuring a book of wallpaper, the names of famous wallpapers. And they were like Queen Astoria Morning Blue, and uh, things that you would simply never think of, like, um, Titanic blue, and that the idea that that you can say of a color as you can anything, that it contains magical properties, or that it contains hidden dangers, secrets, revelations, redemptions, that it can be used in protocols of uh, any sort of imaginary complexity. Uh, they can cause death, they can, they can cause love, they can, they can cure uh, world hunger when adapted properly. That uh, 
poet should be able to do that, or a writer should be able to do that with any word. However, um, I have another exercise which currently one of my students who is going to be in the, the next Margie review with me has, and that is that in the first draft of a poem it's called La Luma River. And I'd like to do that exercise and show you how it works, but in the first draft of that poem I used the word green nine times. And when I read it, it did strike me that I was saying green a bit. And then it did strike me that I said it nine times in a very short poem. And I, I allowed myself to keep one of the nine greens, and I had to change the other eight. And it took me half a day to write the, the poem. And it took me about a month to be able to find what I was trying to say when I said in green jungle, in the green afternoon, uh, what, what was a more psychological and complex and philosophical and mythological way to look at it so that it wasn't a green jungle, but that it was a languid and indolent jungle, a construction of derelict, wayward, fronds. That's better than calling it a green jungle, okay? So, uh, try to stay away from actually using colors and see if you aren't going for uh, a philosophical or psychological quality that the jungle has, uh, the meditative jungle rather than the green jungle or the ravenous, craven jungle but that it have an attribute other than the visual because the writer must keep the word alive by sound and by uh, juxtaposition and rhythm so that we don't completely lose the meaning of why we write. Tell me about collecting sensory data. Well, you try to keep yourself as pure of things like television and iPod so that when you are struck by things that you're more easily able to see small adjustments and um, deviations and uh, tell me about things. tell me about keeping uh the vision, the sense of sight, out of okay. writing and relying okay. on the other senses. Okay. I like my writers to not use sight, how things look, for the first two years that they write with me. And that forces us to use the page in the way that it's meant to be used, which is as a three-dimensional surface. And at its best, it's meant to be read out loud, like Joyce is, and like um, most poetry is. And um, so, when you're the writer, you're not only the actress, and the screenwriter, and the director, but you are also the costume department, you are also the lighting, you are the soundtrack, you are the uh, crew that builds the sets, you're the set designer. Um, so one way you can, you can do this is by taking a color and without ever saying what your color is, and we would randomly get a color, you know, red, green, blue, yellow, silver, and the idea this assignment is that without ever mentioning the name of your color or any other color, that you describe this to someone who is blind. And um, another great assignment is to listen to uh, a poet read in a language that you don't speak and do your own translation of what it might be. I've done several poems that way and they just came out beautifully. And you can also, as you're doing this, throw in lines you do know when you feel like you need to get the language up 
you can take other people's lines and throw them in for this particular draft because you can get rid of them later. So that's a great way also to start something, to start with a few lines of, of a piece that works for you. And then in later drafts, you can get rid of that. But I like my, my students to tell me how things smell, how they feel, uh, how they sound. What, what would be interesting for a writer to do would be to take a painting like Mona Lisa and tell me everything that isn't in the painting. And what is she thinking? What time of day is it? What did she dream last night? What, what is the season? But most of all, what is she thinking? What can she hear outside? You have it every opportunity as a writer. It's like crossing the street. There are directions you can take. You can have someone hear screeching tires, which is such a cliche, and honking horns. Or you can hear this character listening to a nine-year-old girl in pigtails with red bows playing Chopin with insulin and callous indifference. Or you could have her playing, but, but to draw your character into something that they would be listening to that offers you classical mythic possibilities rather than the cul-de-sacs of pop culture. Does that light mean it went out? No, I just made a little change. Hold on. Five. I'm going to read one, two, three, four poems that are in a contest. Oh, in really good shape. All right. That's right. Soon I'm going to get like around four o'clock pick me up. Boy, I'll be all right again then. These are. are we ready? <laughs> yeah. I feel like I feel like my life is online, but I feel like that with every poem. I, I want to read now four poems that are currently been selected to be in a contest. And one thing I love about it, how it's come to pass that these four poems are in this contest, is they are all written in the same room. And they're all about sort of the same thing. So it will either resonate spectacularly like an orchestra or give you a migraine headache. But they are poems written when I lived in a 150-year-old farmhouse. One wrong turn from Pennsylvania in the Allegheny Mountains where they called the border Kentucky. And this one's called Fox and Camouflage. It's an Attica gray afternoon, air like metal, bad food, child abuse, and felonies. I'm a killer. I belong here. Abortion? Okay, I had three. That's the conventional method women use to calculate their dead. Their confirmed kills. Also stillbirths and childhood mortalities. Men have actual head counts, medals, encounters they wear the scars from. Women murder with more subtlety. It's about setups, fallbacks, Subterfuge. It's not bullets, but the caliber of the lie. It's the season for coats trimmed in blue fox. Such pelts encourage a woman's intelligence. Her opinions become elegant, refined, syllables repeated extra points for style. I prefer 
camouflage women kill in pewter. The grand finale is the chances callously missed. I didn't tell my mother I loved her before she died. I, on her deathbed, was soldered shut lips. I know what a crime is. She wanted a bouquet. You sawed dried reeds, rusty sticks for a porcelain vase, a rusty sculpture riverbanks would refuse. Dismiss as orphans. A man might keep a cabinet for rifles. I store a collection of lives for sale. Today, church bells feel like a lash. I don't believe in God. I don't trust anyone. Last week, a slow wind through maples felt like fingernails on a blackboard. It's migraine season, and I have medicines. I carry them when I leave my house for balancing acceleration and despair. I have an accumulation of wounds, want to see. Take the glass to my chest and push in, edge first, and the answer is red, like the check for wrong spelling in third grade. I never forgot my lesions are like babies and kitchen philodendron. I nourish them. They're the silver service I polish and shine. Ants have to die for this inheritance. Cancer, insanity, a bad divorce or two. Then we call the dish festive. A holiday tray. Carve the turkey, slice cake, pecan pie. That's why old women eat alone and die alone with their tarnished china teacups, hand-painted roses and pink rose on the edge where your lip goes. Sometimes I'm beyond the margin, can't find my way back. It's like falling off the rail of a bridge into a charcoal enormity. Drowned women from ferries and rafts float blue as monks blood and larkspur with you. That's the residue, what left from barges, slid from river banks, the Ganges, Thames, Genesee. They were cutting mangoes by moonlight, waiting for the lilac to bud, then suddenly the sliced wrists Blood like a spigot. This is called Burning Apples in Autumn. They're all poems set in autumn in a farmhouse in the Maple <coughs> Forest where apparently a mad woman is living and going madder and madder. She's mad as a hatter in a land where the trees are constantly having a manic depressive disorder, changing colors, coming and going like the cargo ships now I can see from my bed. I've seen my ship come and I've seen my ship go. But here I lived in the maple forest, burning apples in autumn. The infants, take two, <laughs> burning apples in autumn. Hold on, hold on, let me set it up. Burning two, <clears throat> take two. Short your legs showing. Sure. <laughs> put my stockings on, I put my shoes on. Turn <laughs> this into the committee when it's finished. You know, we could send this in as an as a, like added addition to the to the prize. What committee? The video. Oh. The 
video accompanying it. Do they have a website? Well, he's got, the editor has an email. And I think there's probably a website. Yeah, okay. the magazine has a website. Can you move the coffee mug? Absolutely. Okay. Burning apples in autumn. The apples in autumn are yellowing like infants flushed with fever. Wind smells of yearlings and red fox. In the orchard, apples hang like lanterns or the skin of cathedrals. An entire architecture I could wear like cashmere or leather. Last year's x-rays showed my bones glazed and glowing like neon signs advertising roadside motels. The doctor knew he could rent me by the hour. He could tell by my pulse. They lied to me in anatomy class with that cheap circus fetus in a jar act, then that chatter about sacred missions and violations of the flesh. Listen, in monsoon season, arson is an act of love. Dead autumn babies ripped from their shells. This is C-section farmland. Raw wind looting apples, moonlight defines the limbs strung thick with yellow bellies like babies hanging on barbed wire, still alive and mewing. I say it sounds like chimes, incantations amongst the oaks, a sort of choir practice. Amputation is the juncture of purity and intelligence. It requires the loss of body parts. It's a birth in reverse. This is where the river strips. Now they are lynching the stillborns to maples, cauterizing them, stitching them with gut and the razor wire falling from stars. They call it making syrup. I don't live in an orchard after all. I understand now. It's a burn war. These poems were written in September, October, and November. And this was, this is in a contest now in its current incantation. In its current incarnation, it's called November Wild Rags. It used to be called Wild Rags in November. And I so like that title that the first time I went online, my name was Wild Rag. <laughs> and then I took wait, wait, wait. vicious dishing. <laughs> I wonder what your other names are online. Uh, well, that one doesn't exist anymore, but I noticed there are new wild rags have sprung uh -huh. forth from the original. But my name used to be Wild Rag, but no longer. And I really thought the wild rags was significant. That could be why we should go to the art school and see if they're shooting off fireworks right now. They shoot off fireworks. From the tall ships. Oh, really? I don't know. I'm going to look out the window. Because then if we go to the art school and climb up, we can see the fire. Out there, there was like no traffic when I was out before. Were you out? And then I hear the foghorn. And then I think the garden is doing very well. I, my begonias really do a great job. Do you think the begonias are working? They are. And um, as you can see, the, so, the, the, we we're into the diminishing of the sun now. We have to plug your um, necklaces. You have to mention that um, you make necklaces. You think so? Yeah. 
You think this should be fun? If you don't sell some. It's really a website. Okay. Well, you're going to have to cut this up and make it good. No, I think I'll just... It's not... They can't be sold. They can't be sold. Because we never sell anything on the website. So we know that nothing will ever sell on the website. from the California Legislative Assembly, Friends of the San Francisco Public Library. I got this from Assemblywoman Fiona Ma. I'm definitely going to vote for her. Wild rags. The trees in November are wild rags in reverse. Rising with intention, reinventing themselves. Such night vines make their own sly means, their strategies for survival. Who knows what they packed? They are roots blown loose. What did it feel like? Raped by fire or lantern? being blessed by a holy man and then strangled. Between illumination and a severed vein lies one single camera angle. Did you blink? Was there contamination? Do you have proof? These maples could do anything. They are like celestial aberrations on anchored, improvising orbits. Kiev to Antwerp, New York to Vegas, then Los Angeles and Hong Kong. Currents run between women and trees, insomnia and lightning. At 4 a.m. they think, well, the apples were nice, but this November ravaging is heaven. Perhaps such trees are habituated to solitude. It's like a discipline. They can remain in line 16 hours like old women in bus stations, superimposed on linoleum, the color of a dusk mirror. Can you remember rivers? Do you understand? There is no prescription for this. No morphine or ether. No hibiscus for your hair. You are bald after all. Can you say chemotherapy in another language? Awaken. You are round and empty. You demand an erasure. You have no weight, name, visa, no fingers for wedding rings. You are Shiva without arms, compulsively reciting your amputations, dates and circumstances like dynasties you memorized. You wave your stumps like old women talking with flags from ships. You explain you did it to yourself with a pen knife, no anesthesia. There are voices in the stripped maples, mix of wind and red fox. You think you are raw bark, all you require is a mouth. The earth is a trough. You have no vows left. You will stand mute and still and watch the moon until she drops dead. And continuing on, this is one of the alternative uh, routes through autumn. They have many bike trips through autumn, I've noticed. Go biking the one-lane roads of New Hampshire with their charming bridged one lane death traps on them <laughs> and um 
This is another tour of the leaves. It's asthma. I, I just, you know, I, this is an, an unalternative tree leaf food. Well, I cut you those out. I cut those out. That's good. Yes. On an alternative. But tree. <laughs> it takes a lot to cut it out. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. On an alternative tree leaf root. Hold on. On an alternative tree leaf root. On a what? Alternative tree leaf root. You might, without knowing, be pedaling just oh, a mile or so from a woman who happens to be engaged in a ritual known to farm women in autumn, which is to have a confession, thus confession in autumn. Although you might be suspect when you hear that, that the poet who is telling you this is a pathological <laughs> liar, and that let's take this <laughs> confession in autumn within that knowledge. Confession in autumn. The forest is festive in henna, burgundy, and claret. It's a season for alcoholics and drug addicts. Women who wear too much rouge, smoke, collect divorces, run red lights, drunk, feeling themselves coming apart like the landscape in a brutal confusion of amber and russet. Here come the copper-headed women of autumn, ladies of the lamps, flames, stage, gardenias, velvet curtains, and quiet, please. It's confession time. Autumn is a chorus of inflamed women drinking tequila and six packs, poisoning an afternoon. They're in debt, unreliable liars. They sing off key, buy $800 hats, call Bangkok and Bombay from your phone. They have bandages where they once had mouths. Circumstances knock their teeth out. They contain lexicons of magenta like bolts and cargo holds. They sicken, sicken, and no tragedy is a friend. They prefer parts and salt water, fill glass jars with pebbles from rivers, seashells, beads, brass bits, bullet casings. They have improvised childhoods and fluid destinies. That's why their ankles are tattooed, twin bracelets of snake. They have their own anchors. They do not believe in cancer or vote. Spasms of lightning and bouts of rain alone with insomnia at 3 a.m. Your clothing might be thrift shop props, the feather boas, the red stilettos. It's time for another pill or two, an iced vodka in a French crystal glass. Last week she sunbathed topless in Mykonos. Rode a motorcycle from Naples to Amalfi, bought Syrian white on the Spanish steps. She lost her straw hat between Florence and Venice. It disappeared like her squash blossoms from Santa Fe, and the baby at 15 she never talks about. In a Cancun, August, the chartered plane cast a shadow, a miniature black replica like an amulet in a cargo cult or a milagro from a lover meant to be worn at the throat. The plane was a bullet above mangroves. 
in their relentless interior sea, and she thought 1,000 feet to grace, bullseye, the essence of limestone mine, all mine. You can choreograph these women, how they bend, shudder, twist. They eat thunder, thin to bone, where perfume scraped from the dead. Their Chanel scarves are burning, their mouths are wells, black lies have rotted their teeth to stump. They feel fever coming. Outside, a ruin of maples of surprise filigree across branches, soft like oriental gold. This is what I learned in 50 years, a tourist in my own life. Empty was not enough. So where did you get your necklaces from? I made these necklaces. These these are original productions of uh, of the work I do with Farsky crystal and gold are my favorites. Although I'm also working with uh, turquoise and silver for those who feel that gold and ruby do not satisfy all of their cravings and desires in the way they do for me. When surrounded by gold and rubies, I feel more intelligent and like immortality is more inevitable. And I think that there, there is one more submission to this series, which was written by a student of mine. And uh, as Donald was a student, so was Gabrielle. And she has a band now called The Grimlets, and her poem is Prague, 2005. The old Jewish cemetery today, in a reign of implacable resolve, our dead lay as our living, toothsome, crippled, twelve layers deep. A thousand years ago, we were tethered to these streets, leashed, leased. Our leash is as long as our king's benevolence. Sequestered commerce, banished between two bridges, banished to numbers. And Kafka, I wonder what your problem was. Surrounded by garnet relics and grand facades, brocade lanterns and Dvorak and Mozart drawing, a slow cobbled filigree through each open door, and Kafka, I wonder what your problem was. I love that. I read your journals in my 19th year. When were... <laughs> I better start over. This is another poem that's going into the contest from a former student of mine named Gabrielle, who's now fronting a band called The Gremlins. It's called Prague 2005. That is her band. It's The Gremlins. And this poem is called Prague, 2005. The old Jewish... <laughs> okay. This is called... This will also be offered up in the Poetry Prize, written by a very early student of mine. It's called Prague, 2005. A student... Um, it has a band called The Gremlins. The old Jewish cemetery today in a reign of implacable resolve. Our dead lay as our living toothsome crippled twelve layers deep. 
A thousand years ago, we were tethered to these streets, leashed, leashed, our leashes long as our king's benevolence. Sequestered to commerce, banished between two bridges, banished to numbers. And Kafka, I wonder what your problem was, surrounded by garnet relish and grand facades, brocade lanterns, and moats are drawing a slow, cobbled filigree through each open doom. I read your journals in my nineteenth year. You were then my whiplashed twin. Together we raised a thousand blades of terrible grass that grew as weeds inside my paralyzed throat. I hung a cemetery above my neck. Then I could see its shadows from between the two-way mirrors and false starts that followed me as though I were cast in a sick cinema. And Kafka, I watched you with me beyond the mirror at 19. I felt a thin thread pulled taut, intubated down my throat, stood ready with the last pressure to release a violent current of broken glass orchestrated in a ghastly chorus of minor light motifs personally by your own hands and Prague. A single letter separates you from plague, a serendipity singular to my own bloodless language. In the old graveyard today, I walked between yellow daffodils fed by our perennial exile. Even in the ground at last, we are merely passing through the insurrections, inquisitions, the inequities and undersides of each ripe civilization march us inexorably to slaughter like clockwork. It's all numbers, a simple reduction, the final solution. And this cemetery, a mouth wide, twosome, cracked, listing, the headstones of cracks stagger twelve layers deep, twelve hundred years wide. Gollum breathes close down these narrow cobbled stones, its whispered hush rattles the stones left on the tops of the graves, a token from Egypt, the first exile, first, and then a postcard from Alexandria, 1956, a silent slipcard slotted across the Mediterranean and under the door of the Italian hotel. You cannot return. We will send what is left. And Prague, I have watched a stretchy salmon gauze spread across the tops of the forest beyond the castle. The forest harbors legions of trees, heavy as great tiered bears, overfed and slow-moving beasts, eyeless but for vines, crossed with vast lattices, of exterior green veins. And in the cemetery, a gollum blows across the smooth stones left atop the tombs, a thousand-year gasp, the stents of the ages. I feel it rattle still. money I gave you? That 550 bucks I got? So? Well, I need some of it back. I'll your 
prairie. You know what I'm saying, dude? Yeah, all right. You kids have fun, John. You can stick around as long as you want. Cool. Back later. You gotta get excited. Order a za pizza, really have a party. We are gonna have a total Ooh. party that includes takeout. It can include pizza. It can include takeout. We can we can call for people. Like in Las Vegas, we were just in Las Vegas. You want to call for strippers? Bye, and this is call to get this girl now. Do you want to order strippers? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. So, should do you think writers should uh, wear gemstones and jewelry? No, I really, I think that, that actually that this would be too heavy to write in. And that most writing, although it appears to be a sedentary behavior, a sedentary activity, actually people don't know who use computers, the history of writing. And when you had to use a typewriter, and most of my career exists on typewriter, or the first half of my career went on to a, a computer in 1991. So everything was done with a typewriter, and the pages had to be perfect, which meant if you wanted to make any changes, you would have to retype the entire page, often then two pages and a misspelling required being corrected in, in a process using a white out, you painted it, you blew on it, and then you had to line it up correctly and type it so that um, one tended to, to work towards the first draft and everything of course was in hard copy and I'm still uncomfortable in anything other than hard copy, although I do now write on the on the computer and I do make corrections on the computer, I don't feel that uh, I'm really interacting with it till I have a hard copy and I'm making notes on the hard copy and rewriting on the hard copy. But in those days then, changes had to be made and then they would be if it were a small change, it might be done with a paper clip and additional pages typed with a note on the manuscript as to where it was going to go. But by the end of a page, you had usually used every conceivable color in the rewrite, which would be marked one, then you do more rewriting, it would be two, so it would be red pen and one, blue pen and two, green pen and three, Whatever. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> in the rain, I found. Did he leave? Yeah. Did he really leave? <laughs> he really I sure do love you. Hello?